It's a beautiful afternoon for a spring baseball in the big town. Great day for human baseball fans and for the canines. Park in the park in City Field. Man and Beast ready for some action. At City Field in New York, Kick Sports presents New York Mets baseball. Today, the Mets play the Atlanta Braves. And a pleasant good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to City Field. Gary Cohen, Ron Darling with you. Hall of Famer Ralph Connor joins us a little later on. The Mets and Braves play the middle game of their weekend series. The Mets winning last night. And the Mets have won four out of five since Ike Davis arrived on the scene. Lots happened for the Mets last night. Jose Reyes in the three-hole, back-to-back triples. Isanori Takahashi, first big league win, seven strikeouts in relief. But the folks who were here last night, they'll remember it for the long home run Ike Davis hit his first in the majors. You know what's really funny, Gary? I was mingling with the fans today, and to a man, all of them came up to me and said, how come they didn't bring up Davis from spring training? Well, the thing is, is that he is here, and he is performing at such a high level with that long home run last night. Also, I showed the ability to stay in at bats, as he seems to be, even in the short period, the real deal. And while 23-year-old Ike Davis has made his mark this week, 23-year-old Jonathan Neese is doing well as well. Hasn't got a win so far this year, but he certainly pitched well enough to win. He really did. I think he struggled a little bit in Colorado, but his last start was outstanding, especially with people on base. He seems to, as the situation gets tougher, he gets tougher. But he's going to face a tough Braves team here today. He's going to have to go through Chipper Jones and the like. And he'll take on Jair Jurgens, the young ace of the Atlanta staff. Now, Jurgens has had some problems early in the year. He has. In spring training, he had to go for an MRI. They thought his shoulder was pretty weak. He came out of that spring training. and His first two starts were not very good. His last one was better as he's back up to 90 miles an hour now. Jurgens beat the Mets four times last year. They'll try and get the better of him here this afternoon. It's the Mets and Braves on a bark in the park at City Field. All the action coming your way on Pix 11. Audi, truth in engineering. By Capital One Bank, what's in your wallet? By Toyota, Toyota wants you to know they're working harder than ever before for their customers. Toyota, moving forward. By AT&T, find out what's possible with the nation's fastest 3G network. By Tom Warner Cables, all the best, triple play. And by your Tri-State area Volkswagen dealers, visit tristatevw.com. Mets five-game summer premium pickup packs include a premium location ticket to a Subway Series game at City Field, plus one game each in June, July, August, and either September or October. Get your summer premium pickup pack now at Mets.com.
Keys to the game are brought to you by Cadillac. Visit CadillacTriState.com. Well, opposing hitters leading off an inning against Nice have hit 358. Five doubles, a home run, and six walks. Going to have to get better at that. Reyes experiment, day two of hitting third. And I think Jason Bay, Keith talked about it yesterday. He's had a cold streak to open this season. I think Met fans are going to see a hot streak as he moves on his way. So it's the Mets and Braves on a beautiful Saturday afternoon in Flushing. First pitch coming up from City Field. Brought to you by Mazda. Zoom, zoom. What a gorgeous ballpark this is, and what a beautiful day for a ball game. Look up at the promenade level and out on the Shea Bridge that Ike Davis almost reached with his first big league home run last night. So much to do, so much to see, and so many families in attendance today on a gorgeous Saturday afternoon in New York. Here's the Braves starting lineup brought to you by Time Warner Cables. All the best. Triple play. Omar Infante off a three hit night last night. Moves to the leadoff spot for the first time this season. Troy Gloss back in the lineup. Matt Diaz gets a start in left field. An all right hand hitting lineup except for Jason Hayward, the only lefty in the lineup. And he is 0 for his last 11. Struck out three times in the game last night. He'll be the only lefty in the lineup against the left-hander Jonathan Neese. Well, you see Jonathan Neese's numbers so far on this season. Had the one difficult start in Colorado, gave up five run runs. Really, it was that big home run that did him in. But I've been very impressed. It's been outstanding. He's allowed a lot of base runners, but he hasn't knuckled under. And here's the Mets defense by Hyundai. Jason Bay in left field, Pagan and Frank Kaur. Only one error in 48 chances for Reyes coming back. That's a good sign. Right, Cora gets the game today. Gives Castillo a day off. Ike Davis, we all know about him so far. And Henry Blanco is going to do the catching with Nice today and is slated to do the catching tomorrow because he and Pelfa have that good flow going. And for the first time, Jerry Manuel today was willing to say that he might keep Pelfrey and Blanco together because... You know, I think managers are naturally naturally reluctant to designate catchers to pitchers. Especially young pitchers. They don't like to do that. I think if you had a, a Glavin a few seasons ago, a Santana, if they asserted themselves, manager doesn't mind that. Young pitchers, you want them to be able to work with anyone. 
Here's your umpiring crew for this afternoon. Bruce Dreckman calling the balls and strikes. Mike Estabrook will work at first base. Paul Emmel at second. And Bill Hahn, the crew chief, will be the umpire at third. We've got to put Mike Estabrook's days in at least. That's yeah. Estabrook over there, the youngest of the crew. We went backwards around the bases. <laughs> Omar Infante will lead things off. Infante played shortstop last night and had hits his first three times up. And so he's rewarded with another start today as Martin Prado gets the day off. And more than anything else, Bobby Cox is just looking for a spark from the leadoff spot. Braves leadoff hitters this year are 6 for 69. That's an 087 mark out of the leadoff spot. On this team, Martin Prado probably would have played today almost 90% of the time because Chipper Jones usually doesn't play a day game after a night game, but Chipper in there. Chipper's in there because it's his birthday. Yes. And he's 38 today and has had a lot of success playing on his birthday, so he's not taking the day off. There's Escobar on deck, and then Chipper Jones will be behind him. Jonathan Neeson, his fourth start of the year, and it's pulled down to third off the backhand of David Wright, and Infante will beat it out. So David Wright, who has been playing balls off to his backhand this season, had that one clank off his glove. You know, we've seen Ryan Zimmerman from Washington and a lot of infielders start playing this off the backhand. What David needs to do now, and I'm sure he realizes it now, just take one more step over, and then you'll have it in front of your body. That did take a bad hop, but if you're playing it in front, hits off your chest, you got him out of first. And it'll go as an error on David Wright to open the ball game. So the Mets, who had made just 11 errors in their first 17 games, charged with one quickly, and now Yunel Escobar takes a fastball away. Escobar off to a struggling start, hitting a 2.03, got his first day off last night, did appear as a pinch hitter, and there's the birthday kid. You suppose Met fans will sing him happy birthday? Maybe they'll just serenade him with his first name. I drop how old are you now, maybe that song, but uh, they're not going happy birthday on him, I'll tell you that. Two and zero to Escobar, who was benched last night for some lackadaisical play, and a fastball strike. Bobby Cox has had to deal with a few players of that ilk in his time as manager. Probably never dealt with anyone better than he did with Andrew Jones, who had a tendency to be a bit of a slacker early in his career. Well, I think the key for whenever you have guys that are not always paying attention or have attention to detail is that the most powerful weapon you have is the lineup. And uh, when they get the message, not just one day, you get one, two, three days off, and you get the message that you better not do that again. Well, I know he got Andrew's attention, and uh, he became an all-star for Bobby Cox. By the way, Andrew Jones had himself quite a game last night as <laughs> for the Chicago White Sox. A couple of home runs on his 33rd birthday, including a walk-off. I didn't know that, but the two Joneses back-to-back uh, -back birthday days. He walked three in his last start against the Cubs, but he struck out seven and five and two-thirds. Infante runs, ball four, and oh. the Braves have the first two men on. Well, that's a tough call there for the Mets and Jonathan Nees. Nice. That ball looked like it caught tons of the plate, but Blanco comes up a little bit, and maybe that blocked the view of home plate umpire Bruce Streckman, but that's an awfully good pitch. Doesn't sound like happy birthday. No, no. <laughs> Chipper Jones in his career on his birthday is 18 for 41. That's a 439 average with four homers and 10 RBIs. So he knows how to celebrate. Last night drove in a run, went one for three, and he takes low, and Blanco's going to run the ball out to Nice. Good play by Blanco here. He knows that pitch was a pretty close pitch. That last pitch by Nice, not even close. Blanco going out there and, and trying to make sure that the young Nice does not hang his head, get back in the game, let's make a quality pitch. Got to be careful here, though. Chipper Jones will try to, as he did last night, he'll kind of step in the bucket a little, look for something inside the drive. 428 career home runs, which, by the way, is the most home runs for any player born in the month of April. <laughs> Foul back the fastball one and one. Who's second on that list? Andrew Jones. 
Where do you get all this stuff, by the way? <laughs> there are these little elves. They're known as the Elias no, Horse Bureau. I'm going to tell Lynn to get a bigger honeydew list for you. You're not doing <laughs> enough at home. One and one to Chipper, who, to our knowledge, is not yet named a child city. <laughs> And Nice gets ahead of the count one and two. Troy Gloss is hitting cleanup. He waits on deck. Infante at second and Escobar at first with nobody out. Just getting started here at City Field on a 65 degree sunny afternoon. One two and the curveball drops in for a call third strike. Now Nice, who has not used as many curveballs in his last couple of starts, hung a beauty on Chipper Jones for the first out of the game. Well, this might be the best one I've seen him for all year. Two reasons. One, it's back door. Never even touches the plate to the last, sec last second. And right there on that outside corner, nothing Chipper could do as he gives up on that curveball. So that's the first out of the afternoon. And now here's Troy Gloss, who has struggled in his... First few weeks with the Braves. Hitting just 167. And swings and misses at a fastball. Gloss, who missed most of last year because of shoulder surgery and its remnants while with the Cardinals. Matt Diaz hitting fifth in the order on deck. And Gloss this year making the move across the diamond from third base to first base, and that hasn't been easy for him either. We're talking to Joe Simpson, who's the Braves TV announcer, and he said that it's very unusual to him that third basemen, which Glaus was, and a very capable third baseman, once they move over to first, they sometimes doesn't translate into an equal defensive kind of player. Now there's footwork involved yeah. in first base that you don't have to deal with at third. Yeah, you're holding runners on, uh, uh, shuffling to get to your spot, last minute. There's a lot of responsibilities to cut off, things like that. Guy who came up as a third baseman and became a very capable first baseman is in the building today. That's right. Steve Gardner. Saw him throughout the first pitch. One and two to Gloss. And East goes up and away with the fastball, two and two. You know, he's thrown all fastballs to Glaus. The, the scouting report so far on Troy is that he's having trouble, as most older players, power, slow, power hitters, do get a little slow with the bat. Guys get older faster these days. <laughs> Loss is only 33 years old. Well, Gary, in my day, when you were 35, you were just about done. I mean, that's how it always was. A little period there where guys would go up to 40, 41. Those days are over. And I think it's reflected in the decisions that teams are making yeah. now, too. We're more reluctant to give long-term deals to older players. Curveball, and that one stays high, so he dropped the call third strike on Jones, but missed with that curveball, and now it's three and two to Gloss. You know, to go further that point, how many free agents, older players, do we see that never get signed until late in spring training? Mm -hmm. Gloss, a big-time strikeout candidate, so they don't expect the runners to go, and they don't, and Gloss fouls it back. Still three and two. Well, this has to be my favorite uniform that the Mets wear at home. It's that cream-colored one you were telling me, Gary, but I just like the look of it. Harkens back to those days in the 60s. Brand new uniform this year, and it certainly has gotten rave reviews. Gloss takes inside and low ball four. Second walk of the inning for Nice, and that'll load him up with one out for Matt Diaz. So an early crisis for Jonathan Nice. They'll take on Diaz, who's been struggling, as have most of the Braves. They've got a 228 team batting average coming into the day. You know, Gary, the hard part is that Nice now has 36 base runners in 17 innings pitched. And if you continue to pitch with runners on base, you've got to be awful sturdy to get through it every single time. Occasionally, the guy's going to get you. You're playing with fire to have this many base runners. You see Nice has had plenty of company. The Mets lead the league in both walks and strikeouts. And Diaz takes the first pitch curveball inside for ball one. 
Dyer is 0 for his last 12. Making his ninth start of the year today. A guy who has traditionally torn up left handed pitching. Melky Cabrera the switch hitter on deck. 21 pitches already from Nice. Bases loaded one out. And Dyer has got a good rip at that one and one. You know maybe some bad memories. Jonathan Nice is one of his toughest starts. Uh, as a Met was last season in a day game against these Atlanta Braves. On the other hand, two years ago, Jonathan picked up his first major league win with eight shutout innings against Atlanta in September of 08. So he has seen both sides of the equation against this team. And Diaz fouls back the cutter, and it's one and two. Well, they're having some good rips so far in this early innings. Fonte at third base, Escobar at second, and Glass at first. Now, what these can really use right now is a ground ball. I always think of uh, Matt Diaz as a real free swinger. A nice bounced curveball might work here. Now the one two, and he fouls away the fastball. Now the Mets today trying to get to 500 for the season. After dropping to four games under at the end of their road trip. Four wins and five games on this homestand have brightened the mood significantly. Right now Nice just trying to get out of the first inning. One two off the plate and it's two and two to Diaz. Last night John Maine got knocked out of the fourth inning because of injury and the Mets got tremendous long relief from Isanori Takahashi. But when that happens you need the next day starter to go deep. 2 2 struck him out fastball blows away Diaz for the second out. So two strikeouts in the inning to go with two walks for Nice. Well this is one of those cases that Nice did not want to go to three balls and two strikes decided to just let it go. And try to challenge Matt Diaz, but he threw it right by him. So now two out with the bases full, and Melky Cabrera will step in. And what a nightmare it's been for Cabrera, beginning his stint in Atlanta after the trade for the Yankees. One for four last night, but hitting just 135 for the season, and as a right-hand hitter, just one for 17. Cabrera takes high and now needs behind 2 0. Oh. Uh, Jonathan putting himself in a rough position here with the bases full, with the youngster Jason Hayward waiting on deck. I'm sure Henry's going out there and saying, Hey, Jonathan, you need to go after this guy. Didn't you hear the stats that Gary Cohen just gave? <laughs> <laughs> he has been struggling. Good time to challenge him. Throws the fastball for a strike. Well, if I'm Malky Cabrera there, 2 0 with the bases loaded, I think I'm ready to swing, no? Sometimes when you're struggling, you're looking for a walk. And another fastball for a strike, and now it's 2 and 2. So he's coming right back at Malky Cabrera. Another fastball as he dropped the hook. I think he's going to stay with a fastball. And fouled away. The problem here, when you have the bases loaded, Gary, 2-2 two, two to a pitcher should be 3-2. I mean, you really don't want to go any further than that because once you get the 3-2, bases loaded, two outs, guys running around, pressure's on the pitcher. He's shaken off a couple of times. 2-2, two, two, fastball in there! for a call strike three. Nice fans three in the inning and gets himself out of a first inning bases loaded mess. Cabrera didn't like it. Bruce Dreckman did.
Here's your Mets starting lineup brought to you by the Time Warner Cable. All the best triple play. Ike Davis, first career home run last night, hit right about where those tables are out in right center field. Henry Blanco getting his fourth start of the year behind the plate. And the Mets going up against Jair Jurgens, who's been a particular nemesis of theirs the last couple of years. Well, they've got a nice tandem, don't they, Jair Jurgens and Tommy Hansen, as far as young pitchers, uh, outstanding against the NLEs 14 and 6, including 6 and 1 against the Metropolitans. Jurgens now 24 years old and starting his third full season with the Braves as Angel Pagan takes ball one. Pagan won for five last night. Installed in the leadoff spot with Jose Reyes, dropped to number three in the order. And it worked out for the Mets last night in a 5-2 to two win. And Jurgens misses low, 2-0. and oh. Jurgens missed some time in spring training this year with some shoulder woes. And his first two starts of the season, he was not sharp, but kicked it in gear Sunday against the Colorado Rockies. Went eight innings in that game, allowed just five hits, and struck out nine. He's always been consistent in between 88 and 91 in that area. But the first two starts, he was thrown in the 85, 86 mile an hour range. But this kid can pitch. Pagan lifts one to center field shallow. And Melky Cabrera is shading his eyes on a sunny day and manages to stay with it. Tough play for Cabrera with that thin cloud layer in front of the sun. Well, he's trying to block it with his hand. Most outfielders will block the sun with their glove because it's a wider kind of target that you can put up and block that sun out, but Melky trying to do it with his hand. Worked out in the end. And now Alex Cora will step in. Not much wind today, which makes it a little easier on the outfielders. We've had some sunny, windy days early in the season at City Field that have just been brutal for the outfielders. Cora takes a strike. Alex making his eighth start of the year, playing at second base today, giving Luis Castillo a day off. Five for 26 to begin the year, hitting just 192. And Jurgens gets in on Cora's hands, 0 and 2. Well, look at the defense brought to you by your Hyundai dealer. So you can see Diaz, not a great arm in left field, average field at Cabrera in center and Hayward in right, the Phenom. Jones, Escobar, Infante, and Glaus in the infield. And David Ross getting the job catching today. He's done an outstanding job, probably one of the best backups in the game. Ross, a guy who can throw people out and hit home runs. It's a nice combination. And not, kind of like the Mets backup in Henry Blanco. And it's, it's going to be very difficult. It's a difficult job for him because McCann will play 140 games. Well, and McCann getting the day off, day game after a night game, and the Mets starting a left hand pitcher. Cora breaks his back, rolls one out to Infante for the second out. So Jurgens has retired the first two. And so just as he did in the first inning last night, Jose Reyes will take his first turn at bat in the three hole with nobody on base. In the first game of his life, hitting 30 at a pop fly double that he hustled into two bases and a triple into the gap in right center. And he also created a run with an infield pop up. Wasn't really his doing. You folks at home, you want to wonder why Scherzins is so good. Very rarely throws the same pitch twice. To Alex Corey started with fastball away, fastball in, slider in, changeable away for the ground out. That's where his success comes. And he gets the comeback from Reyes with the fastball. The underhand toss ends the inning. So Jurgens with an easy first throws just 10 pitches. And Beast goes back to the mound with no score.
play. I wonder if Murph's going to come back with that look himself when he's ready to play. Jason Hayward leads off in the second inning. Hayward 0 for 4 last night with three strikeouts. And now hitless in his last 11 at bats after a scintillating start to his career. The 20 year old from the Atlanta area, first round pick by the Braves in 2007, has made quite a splash early on. David Ross on deck, and then the pitcher Jurgens here in the second. Rolled toward the middle, and Cora can't quite get to it. Just deflected it in out of the center field. And Cora a little slow getting up as Hayward has himself a base hit. Well, you see this ball up the middle. Cora kind of extended. See how he kind of falls on his side there? Right hand underneath that left side hitting the ground. Probably shook up Alex a little bit. Yeah, you can see he's reaching in. Probably just fell in his ribs a little bit. Yeah, you can see him holding side just a little bit. Sometimes when you dive, you can knock the wind out of yourself. First hit of the game for either side. Now David Ross, the number eight hitter, loops one behind Cora, who has trouble with the sun and makes the catch. Now throwing back to first, hits Hayward, but no chance for him to advance. Not sure whether Cora was deking and having trouble with the sun or whether he really did. I think he really had trouble right off the bat, and then he located it, and he caught Hayward, who was only just walking back, thought he'd take a chance. But you know he's surprised? Like Davis, who was standing behind Hayward. See, Ike needs to be out in front of that bag, and luckily it hit Hayward. It could have went to all the way to the dugout. So that's the first out of the inning. And now Jurgens will bat, and the Mets will look for the bunt. Jurgens a good bunter, and he takes ball one. Not much of a hitter, lifetime 110. Looking down at Brian Snitker, the third base coach, to make sure the bunt is on here. And he gets it down nicely. And Nice makes the play. 1 3 on the sacrifice, moving Hayward up to second. Now there are two out. This is the Mets' 17th and 18th game tonight. And in 11 of the 18, the Mets have started a left handed pitcher. And vis a vis our discussion last night when Maine went out and Takahashi pitched so well about the possibility of Takahashi replacing Maine. If the Mets need a starter, that would only increase that percentage. Yeah. I mean, I gave two reasons not to do it. One, Takahashi had a game of a lifetime. Why would you want to take him out of the place where he's been successful at? And secondly, you'll have four lefties in the rotation, and that's usually it's not a good thing. Curveball for a strike to Infante. Well, if the Mets were to reach into the minor leagues for a starter, the guy who's on turn is Toby Stoner, who pitched last night for Buffalo. But how about this for an intriguing possibility. The Buffalo starter today is R.A. Dickey. R.A. Dickey is a knuckleball. Yes he is. The next time that Maine's turn comes up in the rotation is Wednesday. Against the Dodgers when the Dodgers are scheduled to throw. Charlie Hager a knuckleballer. Can you imagine. Did you say Wednesday is the day that it's late in. Yeah. Why do you ask? I don't work that day. Hang with him, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to remember whether I've ever seen a matchup of two knuckleball pitch. I have. The first game I ever did, Ray Fossey, who's a great ex-catcher who does the games for the Oakland A's, he was sick. He called me. He said, do you mind filling in for me with the Oakland A's game? I said, sure. Got to the ballpark. Tom Candiotti against Steve Sparks. Mm -hmm. Two knuckleballers. Didn't know what to say. So I said nothing. He said the grass looked nice. That's right. <laughs> Curveball from Nice and Blanco blocks it. And that keeps Hayward at second. Thirty eight year old Henry Blanco, everything you could want in a backup mm. catcher. Strong arm, powerful bat, good mechanics. Great working with pitchers. Two and two to Infante, who reached on an error his first time. And Nice misses up and away. I think both Blanco and Barajas really honor their craft of catching. They take it seriousness, serious, and um, there's no uh, no joking with these guys. They catch first, 
hit second. That's not always the case with uh, catchers. 3-2 from Nice, and he struck him out. Nice fans in front, too. That's four strikeouts for Jonathan Nice. Hall of Famer Ralph Conner joins us when we go to the bottom of the second. Mets and Braves, no score. and your local Lexus dealers. Welcome back to the Ralph Kiner broadcast booth where we're very pleased to have with us Ralph Kiner. It's as it should be. Welcome to your, welcome to your season debut. You know, some have been around a long time, as you all know. But they're going to keep you here until I get it right. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Bay leads off the inning with a base hit. <laughs> Jason Bay, of course, having a tough time getting going. He has not had a home run this year. That all outfielders and home runs last year. Amazingly, the first baseman had the biggest amount of home runs, and outfielders were second to the first baseman in baseball. Now, I know you can't remember to the day, but twofold question. How was the longest you ever started a season without a home run about? And secondly, how does that affect a home run hitter when you haven't hit one out of the park in a while? Well, I said the first, and I don't remember how long it was, and I don't want to remember that. <laughs> okay, good. And secondly, it affects you. It really does because you, I used to, you know, you go three or four days without a home run in my case, and uh, I was really, uh, I was really thinking about it. I mean, uh, you, you're paid to hit home runs. And when you go, you have a long spell. I average one point. Well, I average one home run every 14 at bats. But uh, that's uh, that's a pretty good pace. Think about it this way, Ralph. I was informed the other day that I hit my first home run in my 200, 201st game. So six years of depression that's, for me. That's a long time. <laughs> never had a never had a chance to smile. No. <laughs> yeah, but he didn't mention he hit his second home run in the next game. Rolled out to short, and Escobar is going to have to go to first to get right as Bay moves up to second. One away. And now Ike Davis will get his first turn this afternoon. Like yesterday, hit his first major league home run, and it was a bomb. Well, he started the season the right way. If uh, you start out like he has, 389, one home run, and just four games, I mean, you got to be happy with that. I hit my first home run in my third game in the major leagues off Howie Pallette of the St. Louis Cardinals. But uh, that's a tremendous start. One thing I like about him, and I'll tell you, you're probably going to wonder why. He hits a lot like Ted Williams. He has a, first of all, he's built like Ted Williams, a splendid sprinter, they called him in his early days. Stands very upright. A little dribbler. 
And Jurgens throws him out as they move to third. Right here, Davis uh, hits the ball right off the end of the bat. Out in front right there, tops it down the ground, and it comes an easy out. He's had real success everywhere where he has been. Amazingly, his dad was a right-handed pitcher. And Davis could be, I'll tell you, he played a 19 inning ball game. He could have been in that game. He could pitch. By a pitcher at Arizona State. Only in this most humbling of games can one day you hit a ball 450 feet and the next day 12. Yeah, and you can hear the, you can hear the people there. And where'd you get all that power? <laughs> <laughs> it dribbles out by the pitcher. <laughs> Jeff Rancourt tries to hold up and went around. It's 0 and 2. Rancourt to fight his way out of a Yeah, slump. I was just going to say that, uh, Gary, because uh, he's been in a horrible slump. Dropping from the high 400s down now to where he's hitting. 277. He's had two hits in his last 30 at bats. Certainly looked better swinging the bat last night with a double and a 400 foot fly ball, but here strikes out on three pitches against Jurgens. Each team with one hit through two. No score. at City Field as we check out who's hot brought to you by TGI Friday's restaurants quite an early battle for the National League Cy Young in the first three weeks Wow between Roy Halladay and no hit Ubaldo Jimenez look at those numbers for the two of them and Andrew Jones we mentioned last night a couple of home runs including a walk off for the White Sox a resurgent year for Andrew and well he was, Escobar leads off in the third he was so far down he had to move up <laughs> he really went to when he Left the line of braids. He really went downhill. Right playing along the line, right spot to be, and throws out Escobar for the first down. Well, nice footwork by Ike Davis, but like we were talking about that first ball by Infante in the first inning, nice by David. See how he shuffles over to the line and gets that ball almost in front of his body, gathers himself in a nice long throw. Ronnie, we were talking the other day about how David is playing more of the line against. The right hand hitters, and I asked him about it. He said it started with Santana because Johan likes to throw inside of the right hand batters, and he wants Reyes to play the hole and right to play the line. And he said, So I do it for Santana because he wants to me to play there. And he said, now, Then I did it for Ollie because Ollie wants to be like Santana. <laughs> He's got a long way to go. <laughs> and the same, yeah, you know, with knees throwing the cutter also yes. inside to the right hand hitters now, it, it, it makes some more sense. And I, I think even more so for Santana is the changeup. Right handed hitters are going to tend to really try to pull that down the line. And if you're. As Chipper strokes one the other way toward the right field line and just foul. And if you're a pitcher like Santana, 
who is so good at his craft. I think he's thinking to himself, you know what? I want him to get that ball down the line because anything between third and short that's a hit, I can work out a single problem. But, you know, doubles, of course, put him in a little uh, a bad way, although it didn't in his last start. I think David, in a perfect world, would like to play further toward the hole. But he said the most important thing is for the pitcher to look back and for me to be in a spot where he's comfortable. <laughs> And the curveball in for a call third strike. Second time Nice has gotten Chipper Jones looking at that outside corner curve. And that's five strikeouts for Nice. And two really good curveballs to get him. Oh, Chipper Jones dropped off last year 100 points on his batting average. The only other player that even came close to that was a player with the Detroit Tigers. He dropped off 100 points after leading the American League and hitting. That was uh, Norm Cass. Wow. Norm Cass, a uh, first baseman for the Detroit Tigers. And Cass said after he led the American League in hitting, I owe all my success to good beer and a cork bat. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they either stop making beer or stop <laughs> corking bats after that. I think beer is still good, but <laughs> cork bats are out. Well, Keith's got no beer, but he's got a corked wall. So uh, there you go. Troy Gloss lifts one to center field, and Angel Pagan battling the sun, and he can't make the play. Gloss heads for second. Pagan heaves it in, but not in time. Well, he had the sunglasses on. He had the glove up for shade, but it did him no good, and Pagan unable to corral that ball in the sunshine. Again, another player, instead of using the glove, now he uses the glove. And it looks like he had it there, but he was not. Look at the, where the glove is. It's not shading his eyes. Yeah, you got to shade your eyes. And the other thing you have to do is kind of side saddle. Turn your body so that your eyes are not looking directly into the sun. That's the whole answer right there. You have to turn your body away from the sun, and your head turns, of course, with your body. And then you have a chance to get that ball out of the center of the sun. If it's in the center, the glasses don't help. Well, I think you're right here. What happens? Gary showed it. The glove came at the wrong direction of the sun. The sun blinded him for just that split second, and that's what made him miss the baseball. And they're scoring that as a two-base hit. A gift for Troy that's, Gloss. That's really a gift. That's Christmas time right there. I guess the question is, Ralph, what is the responsibility of the fielder? When do you score that a hit? And when do you score it an error? I think a lot depends on where you're playing. If you're in Little League, that should be a two-base hit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think that answers that question. One and two to Matt Diaz. <laughs> we, we certainly wouldn't want to hurt a nine-year-old's feelings, Ralph. No, he couldn't do that. <laughs> See, the nine-year-old would close his eyes anyway. That's, that's right. <laughs> Well, Pagan hoping it doesn't cost Jonathan Nisa a run. Nisa ahead on Diaz one and two struck him out first time up. That's amazing to me. I see these representatives from 2,000 different sunglass companies. They come in and they have the whole beautiful big box full of sunglasses and they're beautiful, styling, look great. And none of them work, by the way. The old flip down ones uh, seem to be the best ones still today. That's the old fashioned ones. You knock them down with your hand and they flip down on hinges to cover your eyes and help you out. Well, David Wright still wears the, the flip down glasses. Nice, old they're, school. They're really better. There's yep. no doubt about that. I love the way Casey Stengel said how you play in the sun. He said you go out and you get down like the Indians used to do in the old days on down and low down and keep your hand over your eyes. Let the ball play you. <laughs> Let the ball play you. Who <laughs> just missed the inside corner with that fastball? Two and two to Diaz. Indians looking at a posse out there coming over the hill. <laughs> nice pitch here by Nice. Just missed. Well, Casey was known for the fact that he once stopped his cap to the crowd and a bird flew out. <laughs> <laughs> He picked that bird up in the outfield. It was a kind of an injured bird. It's running into something. And it was kind of knocked out. 
put it inside his cap. And when he came to the plate, the crowd gave him a big hand. He got back to play in Brooklyn again. Yeah. And he took his cat off, calf, calf off, and the bird flew out and flew away. <laughs> I mean, those are the good days. Yes. <laughs> One time, Casey... But he turned around and got two strikes on him. And he turned around to the other side of the plate instead of there for the <laughs> third strike. Two two to Diaz, and he fouls off another one. Well, there's a reason Casey's number is on the wall here at City Field. He may not have won a whole lot of games when Casey was managing the Mets back in the 60s, but he sure kept everybody entertained. He was great. He really was. He knew what he was, and he knew what he was doing. That double talk was all of that. He was a very, very smart man and became very rich. I mean, he invested his money right, right, and earned the whole oh, had a bank in Glendale, California. All for a guy who at one time was going to be a left-handed dentist. And he couldn't find a chair that was left-handed. That's why he quit. <laughs> he didn't make the chairs for right-handed and left-handed people, only for right-handed people. Tenth pitch to Diaz, and he walked him. Third walk given up by Nice. So two aboard with two out. Behind this door is $100,000 in free money. Now picture yourself alone in the vault for 60 seconds. 60 seconds to carry out as much cash as you can and keep it. The PIX11 cash grab for your chance to win. Watch the PIX news at 10 tonight. <laughs> Chip yourself in honey. That's a good idea. If that's in the rules. <laughs> Here's Melky Cabrera with two out of two on. And he fouls that cutter off at his feet. Melky didn't like the umpire's call of strike three on him when he was last time up. Remember the time when the National League had a strike zone was different from the American League? America League was uh, they would call high strikes and National League only low. Now they're all under one commissioner. That's what the American League umpires had that big bubble protector yeah. that looked over the top of it. That's right. They just stood up straight with that big uh, balloon type thing. Jason Hayward on deck. Loss at second with a sun aided double. And Diaz at first. He's forced to throw a lot of extra pitches here in the third inning because of that play in center field. And doesn't get the call against Cabrera this time. It's one and two. Good point, Gary. That's one of the things that people overlook with inability to make plays is the building up of the pitch count, which has become so popular. And that was a strike there for Mr. Nice. Probably more than the one he got called out on the last yes. time. Curve ball hit to center field. Pagan in front of this one. Sun no problem. Inning over. So Nice survives in the third. Pushing it to the bottom of the third inning with no score.
M G. Henry Blanco leads off the home third inning. Blanco making his fourth start this afternoon. One for 12 on the season. And Chipper Jones has come out of the game. Two strikeouts, he didn't want to play anymore. Martin Prado has taken over at third base for the Braves. It has been a litany over yeah. the last five years of small injuries that have taken Chipper Jones out for periods of time. He missed three games earlier this season with an oblique injury. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a, one of the big injuries that he's had. It's almost like it's a recurring injury. And uh, unusual because you know, Chipper loves to play on his birthday. Started today. But two strikeouts later, he's out of the game. Last night, an awful night for Chipper, dropping a couple of pop ups. Two and two to Blanco. Now, when he goes in the Hall of Fame, it is about a sense to go in the Hall yeah. of Fame. Where do you put him in left field? Or you put him in third base. He gave up playing third base where he was almost a sense to be the third baseman in the Hall of Fame and played left field. Well, I, I think he goes in as a third baseman, doesn't he? I think he will. Yeah. yeah. The vast majority of his careers were played. But they don't let really done stuff exactly do the way he did. You know, I, I think of another player of his generation, uh, Craig Biggio, that did that also. Moved from a catch catcher to second yeah. base, to outfield, back to second base. Right. He uh, made the all-star team as a catcher and a second base, but yeah. no one's ever done that. And Blanco fouls off the breaking ball. Well, Henry Blanco's played just about everywhere, including for the Atlanta Braves. Spent two years with Atlanta in 2002 and 2003. That he was Greg Maddox's personal catch. Nice. Because. Uh, what a great job that is. <laughs> Maddox always worked with the backup, whether it was Eddie Perez or Blanco. Check swing grounder. And Jurgens with the play, one away. And I don't think it was necessarily a knock on Javi Lopez. It was more the fact that Lopez just couldn't get low enough for Maddox. He, he tended to sit up high, and that's, that's why Maddox didn't like the pitch to him. I also think it was a little bit of a knock. <laughs> yeah, because I think that um, I think Maddox did not. Maddox was into pitching perfect kind of ball games, and he wanted a catcher out out there with him that was catching first. Greg Maddox first. Let's get this job done. And and Javi Lopez, of course, a real capable offensive player too. But he, I think that he took a lot of pleasure out of having that guy on the bench and sitting next to him during the games and discussing baseball and how to strategy and how to pitch against guys and four days later they both worked together it, it worked that kind of relationship for him well let me ask you this I mean everybody knows that the Braves won 14 straight division titles and won only one World Series now generally during that stretch when Maddox was there he would use the backup catcher all during the regular season and in the postseason Javi Lopez would play every game how much do you think that that hurt the Braves in the postseason? Unless it was an American League Park, um, and then you could use the TH. But I, I think it definitely hurt him because he had this rapport all season long where he's styling winning 19, 20 games. That was a, thought to be maybe a problem last year, though they played through it, was the... Um, with the New York Yankees because right. the AJ, no, AJ Burnett and, and Jorge Posada. Posada did not start a couple of those games. Didn't seem to matter, though. 2-2 two, two to Jonathan Neese, and that's low. You know, it's, thought he had strike three. that's one of the most debatable things in the world when you have a personal catcher. Why would you do that when you have a batter like Lopez, for example, yeah. who could hit? I mean, you want, the, you want the bat in the lineup. He could drive in runs, and he certainly wasn't that bad a catcher. But to put a, a catcher in there as a personal catcher, yeah. well, my Carver was that way with right. uh, Steve Carlton and the... And there was no question about that. I, th I think what happens for if you're a pitcher of Maddox, Maddox's stature, you can do it. The, the guy's not going to play every day anyway. The, the backup catcher's got to catch uh, once every five or six games. He's hanging it really well this at bat, but Diaz playing right on the line makes the play for the second half. 
So why not catch me? I guess that's the thought. And of course, you never know what's going to happen because remember 1999, Eddie Perez winds up being the MVP of the National League Championship Series against the Mets because uh, he got to play. Yeah. He set himself a fine at bat there. Hang with them. They had him defended perfectly. <laughs> Here's Pagan. Fly to center his first time. Hooks this ball to right. Hayward drifts over. And that does it for the Mets in the bottom of the third. Well, a familiar start to another Met game. Not a lot of scoring early. You go to the fourth with no score. Field quite heavily populated today. It's become a very um, popular place for people just to hang out and stand and watch the game. Yeah, it really has become a gathering place. Today's high speed pitch brought to you by Fios TV, Internet and Phone. This is Fios. This is big. Jason Hayward leads off in the fourth inning. Hayward had a face it up the middle his first time up. Well, have you gotten to watch much of Hayward? A little bit. I haven't had really a good chance to watch him for too long, but he got off to a great start, as you all know. And you think about guys like this guy, could be another Willie Mays type of hitter or something like that. Mays had a strange start in his major career. I think he went 0 for 21. Was that it? Yeah. Yeah. And then hit a home run off Warren Spahn for his first major league base hit. Didn't he go to the manager said I want to go home. I yeah, want to he go wanted to go back to Minnesota <laughs> where he came from. and he uh, and he, uh, he was, uh, I don't want to play in the major. I can't make it up here. It's too tough. And uh, yeah, DeRosier, DeRosier said no way in the world. You're going to go back to the money league. He could see the potential and what kind of a ball player he had. You know one time there was a time when the Giants could have almost had Hank Aaron and Willie Mays on the same team at the same time. What a combination that would have been. Reyes throws out Ross for the second out. John Mullen was the GM of the uh, of the Atlanta Braves, and he said he, within the one half hour he got a telegram to the Commissioner of Baseball, and they made the difference in whether Mays was going to be playing with Aaron and with the Giants or whether he wasn't. And he uh, Atlanta won out that argument, wow. and uh, he they didn't go, didn't play in the same team. Can you imagine? Churches takes his well, it's it's amazing the things that will transpire with a lot of the great players that if they had not if it not happened, I mean Tom Siebel with the franchise here, uh, the franchise here, his whole after, story again here. Braves had signed him illegally out of college. How about Roberto Clemente? The Dodgers allowed him to leave in the draft to go to the Pirates. <laughs> Good inning for Jonathan Neese. Still no score.
Brewers with the Braves concludes tomorrow night at 8.05 p.m. Visit Mets.com or call 718-507-TIXX for your tickets now. Pitchers duel so far between Jonathan Neese and Jair Jurgens, the 24-year-old from Curacao, first pitcher ever from Curacao to make it to the major leagues. And I think they think of him as their ace. Now, Tommy Hansen, of course, is coming on strong, and he probably has uh, the best stuff. Uh, Hudson, of course, has been a great pitcher for years, but he's coming off an injury, although he's throwing fantastic. Probably the guy that struggled the most has the best record, and that's uh, Derek Lowe. He's they scored all the runs. Yeah, there. he's got three wins. Kawakami was uh, outstanding last night for five innings. You know, we ran out of gas. You can't go by their hitters. Their hitters are having a terrible yeah. start. Yeah. I mean, their hitting has been horrible for you know, that lineup race. Alex Cora leads off the home fourth inning, grounded out to second base his first trip. Well, the Braves had such a surplus of pitching that they made the deal with the Yankees yeah. to send Javier Vasquez for Melky Cabrera. Now, that was partly financially related, yeah. but they also felt as though they were boosting their offense, although it hasn't worked out that way so far. Well, when you think about it, uh, these teams mirror each other the way they've started out these first 18 or 19 games. They see three wins for low, but that high ERA. Kawakami's ERA is high, but he's pitched better than that. And the thing you have to be really encouraged about is Tim Hudson has worked really hard to come back, and he's throwing outstanding. He's one of the great, great competitors of this game. Two and one to Cora. And he slaps one to shortstop. Escobar runs around it and uses that strong arm one away. Here's Reyes who had a comeback for his first trip. Well, Starting with that four hit game on Tuesday night against the Cubs, Reyes has started to get his game in gear. Still not running in terms of stealing bases the way you're accustomed to seeing him. You know, Gary, when they took him out of the uh, leadoff spot and put him in on the third base, I mean the uh, third position in the batting order, that took away his base hit right there. Well, I think it's pretty interesting that five of his six at-bats since the new lineup have been with no one on. He had the one chance last night. Well, the biggest problem in terms of stealing bases is he doesn't have Luis Castillo behind him now, a guy who would take yeah. pitches for him. He's got Jason Bay who's going to be up there hacking away. And you really don't want to take away the chance of Bay to hit the home run because Bay has been a home run hitter and also an RBI man. Led the outfielders in the American League in home runs and runs batted in with the Boston Red Sox. Well, I, I'm probably in the minority here, but I, I still believe that Wright, Bay, and Frank Core, if they're hitting, the best lineup is with Reyes in the leadoff position. I agree with that. I think he had to be a leadoff batter, no doubt about it. He, for some reason, he doesn't make me think of him as a th third pace hitter. Well, right now, I think the goal is to lengthen the lineup. Yes. But, you know, there's another piece to that, too. If Ike Davis keeps hitting the way he's been swinging the bat, you know, and Jerry wants to break up those right hand batters, Davis will provide him a tool to do that. Well, he's got a good possibility of being a very good left hand batter. And that could make a big difference. The Mets need a left hand batter in the line. Yes. Yeah. But they can hit with power. I mean, they, they have to get some power in this organization. 3 2 to Reyes, down low ball four. And Jurgens has issued his first walk. And now Reyes is aboard. Only the second base runner for the Mets today. Now you wonder whether he will run in this spot. I would say that no chance. Well, you, you can believe in this if you want, but Jerry has said that he needs Reyes to run in these spots because he wants Bay to get, or be a threat to run. Bay will get more fastballs. Here's the difficult thing about it. You think it. it's that simple? I don't. No but, way yeah. in the world is that simple. I mean, they're not going to become the guy running on the bases. They're going to take away and not throw, not throw curveballs no. to Bay. No way. But here's the other piece of it. Reyes throughout his career has not been a guy who runs early in counts. Well, he never he, does. He generally waits. Yeah. He's a, he, he, when you want him to go on the first count, he won't go. 
Hayward under the fly ball by Bay, and that's the second out of the inning. So Bay for the second straight at bat puts the first pitch in play, and you know, that certainly has an impact as well. Yeah, it does. I, I think the only thing I would believe in, Ralph, is that if you get a pitcher who has not honed his craft yet, and he wants to kind of surprise Reyes with a slide step and hangs a breaking ball, that might help Bay. But as far as seeing what kind of pitches Bay is going to see, I, I never, I never thought that boy. I got Ricky Henderson on. I'm not throwing any breaking balls. I never ever thought, never crossed my head. Well, the one thing about Wise in the Hall of Fame is that you can't, you couldn't throw him out. So it didn't matter what you threw. It didn't make any difference at all. No. Here's Wright who grounded to short his first time up, and Reyes has to dive back in ahead of the tag. I don't think they want him to be running right now. They still worry about that leg, and that's really the question. Is it a problem? Well, he legged out a triple last night. He ran well. He certainly looked like he was running well. But well, home to first is where it looked, has looked as though he has not quite been as swift as in the past. Hasn't done much running between first and second. You know, when you pull those hamstrings, you used to do it starting when you're starting to run. That's when they go. Reyes has two steals this year. One one to right, but first to throw. You know, get back to when Reyes was leading off and Castillo in second. There's a relationship there, a symbiotic relationship, where Castillo will take pitches for Reyes. You would never ask a power hitter like a right or a bay to ever take a fastball down the middle to allow him to run. Absolutely true. And why would you want to? Yeah, because you want you want those power hitters having three whacks at it, a chance to go deep three times. You know, when you get right down to it, when you're really a good power hitter, you get maybe one shot if you're lucky to get a ball you can hit out of the ballpark. Otherwise, they're going to be around the edges and try to make you go off after their pitch. Wright goes down swinging at the fastball. Jurgens has his second strikeout, and Reyes is stranded at first. Four of the books at City Field, Mets and Braves still scoreless. But I'm enjoying it right now. You're a suburban guy. Yeah, only by duress. <laughs> exactly. It'd make a nice park if they could do that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Beautiful. Mr. Olmstead did very well. He did. As a call strike to Omar and Fonte as we start the fifth inning. Well, familiar territory. The Mets the last three days haven't scored in the first four innings. But they seem to have been able to put their offense together third time around the batting order. We'll see if that works out today. Bounced out to short and Reyes runs around it. 
And throws that in front there by a stride, one away. Well, he had to hurry on that play. Right? He got down the line of Fonte in a real hurry. Well, there's our old friend Billy Wagner making his way across the outfield and out to the Braves bullpen, making friends along the way. <laughs> Billy is never at a loss for conversation. Oh, he's uh, he's great. He's one of the real characters of the game. It was a very enjoyable experience having yeah. Billy Wagner in that Mets clubhouse. Absolutely. Here's Janelle Escobar, who has walked and grounded out 0 for 1. And Jonathan Neese, who has had to pitch around trouble this afternoon, has managed to keep the Braves off the scoreboard. The only downside is that his pitch count has taken a hit along the way. 1 and 1 to Escobar. That was his 78th pitch of the afternoon. You can see that first inning, especially troublesome. Two walks and an error right off the bat. The other side of that coin is he struck out a lot of batters again, and uh, that's another reason why the pitch count is up. Six strikeouts, just one shy of his career high. Martin Prado, who took over for Chipper Jones, is on deck. The word on Chipper is that he left the game with a sore right hip. Mm. I think that's a new one. So not a very happy birthday for Chipper. Three and one to Escobar. And that's a fastball strike three and two. Well, I've um, first 20 games of the season or so. The theme for me, I've never seen so many three one, three two fastballs taken. Ball four and Escobar is on. You know, one of the things that they've come up with, which is new to baseball as far as I'm concerned, is that they call three one pitches, two zero oh pitches. Uh, Hitters pitches. Yeah. Like it's automatic fastball. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It, it, it isn't that way if you're a good hitter. You don't know it's going to be automatic or if you can hit. Well, I think the one thing, whether whatever pitch it is, when your hitter works himself into that count, the pitcher's got to catch a piece of the plate. I mean, that's that's the advantage. Well, the one thing, if he's going to throw a curveball in that spot, and most real good hitters are going to get breaking balls or not a fastball because everyone's smart enough, at least most of the pitchers are smart enough to know that he's looking fastball. That's the first time I've ever heard you say pitchers are smart. Well, I, well, well, I was trying to be nice. It's called a moment of weakness. <laughs> I, I take it all back. It's only because I'm in the booth. When Keith's here, he can go the other oh, way. Yeah, I got <laughs> it. You, you should and hear the thing. Keith would agree with me, too. That's right. <laughs> Two and one to Prado, who's third in the National League in batting right now at 406. Started last night and went one for four. He has turned himself into quite the hitter the last couple of years. Troy Gloss waiting on deck. And Prado fouls one into the dirt on the cutter. Two and two. We went back to the third inning. You see this cut by Chipper and very laboriously running down to first base so you can tell that he's hurting right there took a call third strike on a curveball later in that at bat and haven't seen him since 2-2 to Prado and he strokes one foul you know, it's interesting Ralph I was watching an older game that you were doing this winter and you were talking about that the 3-1 count is the hitters count you were doing uh, extra base hits, and this was before they called them extra base hits. And you called them, uh, this batter has three long uh, or 52 long hits. That's how it reads in the uh, the record book. That's right. Yep. Long hits, yeah. yep. doubles, triples, and home runs. The terminology of baseball has changed an awful lot, but the one thing that really gets to me: most people call. These little nickel curves of what they are, they call them sliders. Yeah. The slider right now, the way a real old time slider was was a was a cut fastball. Yeah. That was a slider. Hard fastball that would move. Kind of like what Nice is throwing. Well, one thing about a, a so-called slider is the fact that it's a pitch you could throw when the count is in uh, hit his favor. 
it's a breaking ball. Yeah. Now, where did the expression nickel curve come from? From uh, uh, <laughs> Frankie Fritz, the manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates, St. Louis Cardinals, or you name it. He hated that pitch, and he called it a nickel curve, the slider. <laughs> I mean, it was a lousy curveball. Don't throw it. If, you got, if I catch it throwing it, you're going to be fine. Prado has to move his feet to get out of the way. Of course, Frankie Fritz was from Fordham. Was a was a college graduate. He was what a, a flash. Right? Yeah, Fordham flash. It's a lot of Fs. Switch hitter and one of the best players that played uh, in the game, an infielder that could hit and run. And the manager of the gas house guy. Yeah, he was a tough guy, I'll tell you that. Lived in New Rochelle. He would try to get out of the second game of the doubleheader on Sunday, which they always played, to go home early so he could be in his house in New Rochelle when he came in on the road. Runner goes and Prada rips one to left field. Bay has to chase it toward the corner. Escobar to third. He'll be held up there. And Prado into second base with a double. So Martina Prado comes off the bench for an injured Chipper Jones. Lines a double, and the Braves are the best scoring threat of the day. Well, Prado has become a doubles machine. 38 last season in his first year of playing every day. And rips this ball by right. You talked about it before, Gary. Right playing on that line opens up that hole a little more. And with Escobar running on the pitch, Bay had to hustle over to make sure that ball didn't go to the wall. Otherwise, Escobar would have scored. You know, one of the big advantages of left hand better, and they have several, but they have a big one. They can hit the ball to the opposite field better than a right hand better can do it to right. And you also had the advantage of the first baseman playing on the bag with the runner on first base. And they have the hole they threw. So there is a big advantage if you're going to try and make your best boyfriend or best uh, child a ball player, <laughs> make him a left hand batter. There you go. So here's Troy Gloss. Let's see how the Mets play their infield here. Scoreless game in the fifth inning, second and third, one out. And they will play essentially back up the middle. Cora backing up. Loss takes up and away with a curveball for ball one. And the curveball has been a much bigger piece of Nice's repertoire this afternoon. Well, he's got a good curveball. He can really set it up and he sets it up with a fastball. There was a fastball right there. Well, if you're going to have someone up, the big swinger is who you'd like to have up with this second and third. And and one out, an opportunity to get the strikeout. Well, here's a guy that was a big third baseman, 6'5 and 240 pounds. I, I would think of myself if I'm out there pitching now, Gary, it's a 0 0 game, really stuck in a place where I, I don't feel I can give up runs. I feel like I can get Glaus maybe on a strikeout. He's a big strikeout guy. I can walk Diaz to first base and go against Cabrera who's hitting the buck and change. That's a good way to think. And, and first base is open. But Loss a... drives it toward right center. Frank Cork gets over to make the grab. And Escobar forgot to tag up. But the runner Prado heading to third. Now they've got Prado hung up. And Reyes makes the tag. Coming home for the throw. But that's the third out of the inning. Reyes forgot how many outs there were. Threw the ball home. But the Mets Double up Prado as Escobar made a base running blunder. Instead of tagging up, he cost the Braves a run.
cost more without free score. Braves and Mets still scoreless because of the base running misadventure of Yunel Escobar. Well, when you watch Escobar here on this drive by Glaus, it almost looks like he forgot how many outs there were. So then he goes back to third base to try to tag. And, of course, nice heads-up play by Cora to get the runner in a rundown. Reyes tags him out. Did not have to throw home. I don't know if Reyes forgot how many outs there were, but he did not have to throw home. And Dobby Cox with the hat off. That tells you right now, don't go near him. Well, you saw Cox's reaction last night when the Braves messed up the infield fly play and cost them a run. Now, a base running misadventure by Escobar, who's already been in Bobby's doghouse and got benched last night. It'll be interesting to see how Cox reacts to that. Ike Davis had a comebacker his first time up. I wonder had Chipper Jones not already come out of the game and cost him his backup infielder whether Cox would have pulled Escobar right there. Mr. Escobar would have been out of the game also. Just uh, embarrassing. Can you imagine coming with your son or daughter trying to explain that play to him? What a joke. Mike Davis down swinging. That's the third strikeout for Jurgens and the first out here in the bottom of the fifth. Well, he's retiring at the end of the year, but I think he feels as though he is been pushed in that direction I the last two days. He's never retired of this game. I know. Poor, kind of base running. poor Bobby, I hope he makes it. <laughs> right. He gave him a chance, yeah. He's been thrown out of more games than any manager in the history of the game of baseball, beating the record of McGraw. John McGraw was noted for his uh, temper and his uh, tremendous coaching ability. Uh, he was an amazing uh, Manager for the Giants most of his career. Well, not only that, think about Atlanta. Atlanta scuffling to score runs. Troy Glaus is scuffling to hit with runners in scoring position. He takes a beautiful at bat, hits a seed to right center, and uh, he's got an offer to show for the first base. Yeah, he gets just credited for a double play. <laughs> I hit him while they hit another double play. That's the way he plays. <laughs> Jeff Frankfurt got another outfield assist. Oh, that's right. Nine, four, five, six on the double play if you're scoring. But, you know, you mentioned the ejections. Bobby actually said the other day, I thought this was fascinating. He said the reason he's been ejected for more games than anybody else is because they've won so much. He says you argue more when you're winning than you do when you're losing. But that was a very interesting cup. I wonder if it's true. I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to. I'd like to um, see what his answer would be in private. How come he gets thrown out so much? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, any, is he blame it on the empire? Yes. That's what blame it on. Anytime you put a microphone near him, you can hear that he mutters about virtually every strike call. Yeah. So you know, he's, he's already ahead of the game. That's right. He was a very calm, nice little infielder one time in his major league career. <laughs> Came up with the Yankees in the late 60s. Amazingly, he went from being general manager of the Braves to a manager of the Braves. And his timing was good, too. He came into the dugout just when they were ready to start winning. He had that great pitching staff for all those years. Ten Tons years. Yeah, ten years those guys were together, Ralph. Smoltz, Clavin, and, uh, and Maddox. Maddox. What was the left hand of that? He was a good Avery. Steve yeah, Avery. Avery, he was a good pitcher, too. Yeah, he could hit. He's had a four hit game at Shea Stadium. I remember. I remember. Three and two to Frank Core. And Jeff hits one in the air to deep right, deep to left center field. Over goes Diaz near the edge of the track to reel it in for the second out. Friday on the picks game of the week, the Mets and Phillies clash for the first time this season. It's the rivalry Mets fans look forward to every year, and you can see it first on picks. The Mets battle the Phillies Friday at 7, right here on picks. Not too out and Henry Blanco, the batter. Blanco had a comebacker to Jurgens his first time up. That's have had just one hit. Jason Bay's single leading off the second inning. I feel like a broken record. <laughs> Popped up, shallow center field. Cabrera started back 
Blocken, so it's left to Infante, who can't make the play, and Blanco has himself a pop fly single. Well, Infante was the guy who got closest to it, but Cabrera broke back on this ball, and that's why he was no help. Well, there's a few mistakes here. One, Infante loses the ball in the sun. That could happen. Cabrera broke back. And, you know, Escobar in this really tough sun, you want to go out there and help your other infielders. You get as many bodies in the area as you can to try to make a play. Because the shortstop has the best angle in terms of not losing that ball in the sun. There you go. But that's a real tough catch for the shortstop, though. No, that he would have to go a long way. But I think in, in these kind of situations, when it's sunny, when it's windy here at City Field, everyone's got to kind of converge, Ralph. To, to, to even if you can't catch it, you can help your other infielder out. That's true. Very true. Oh, and two to Jonathan Nice, who lined out to left his first time. Huh? Escobar and Infante communicating as Blanco takes off and the throw to second high and Blanco has a stolen base. How about that? Henry Blanco sneaks a stolen base. That is his first stolen base since 2001. Nine years. Oh, just this high throw from Ross. But the element of surprise by Blanco, and this is, you know, you, you might laugh it off because he hasn't stolen in so many years. Nice play with two outs here. A chance to get first run on the board. And he shoots one toward the middle. Escobar with a sliding stop and throws him out to end the inning. Blanco's fifth career stolen base in his first in nine years, but the Mets can't convert it. And after five, it's still a scoreless game. Tri-State area Volkswagen dealers. Visit TriStateVW.com. Look at the Brooklyn Bridge. Here's your Mets upcoming schedule brought to you by Capital One Bank. What's in your wallet? One more game with the Braves tomorrow night. We'll be back with you on SNY on Monday with the Dodgers in town without Manny Ramirez, who's not only on the DL, but will not make the trip. The Dodgers have announced. So it's, got a, it's got a bad calf, right? Well, Joe Torre was quoted as saying he is not coming to avoid the circus. Yeah. <laughs> that he feels would ensue if Manny showed up in town. I'm not sure Manny rates a circus this year. I think that was last year. He doesn't rate a circus. He doesn't even rate a circus when he's playing. <laughs> Matt Diaz leads off in the sixth inning of a scoreless game. Well, last Saturday, the Mets played a scoreless game for a while. Until the 19th inning. <laughs> well, you know, the Mets have played some unbelievable long games. 
They played the only game to a decision when they lost to the Cardinals in 25 innings. Longest game ever played in the major leagues, 26 innings. It was a tie. Both pitchers went the full distance. Austin was Eschker. one. Yeah, Leon, uh, Joe Eschker. And, and, and Cador. Yeah. yeah. Brooklyn and Boston. They, boy, yeah, they both went not, the full distance of that ball game. Wow. 26. Anybody get a pitch count? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, the Mets had that doubleheader where they have won 23 innings in the uh, second game of the doubleheader on Sunday. 1964 with the Giants. That was the Giants, and uh, Bolomiz played shortstop in that game. Oh, and the Mets turned a triple play in that game. That's right. And then the longest one nothing game in history. That was the, uh, the one in the, uh, with the Astros. That's right. 68, and you remember Ralph, I'm sure, the uh, common denominator in all three of those games. Same home plate umpire. Oh, it's all three. Oh, Sudo. It's yeah, Sudo. Ed Sudo. That's right. I forgot about that. But the game last Saturday was the longest game the Mets have ever won a 20 inning affair. Young star, veteran manager. I'll never forget that you know game button. in Houston. <laughs> I was on the bus. We were leaving town. I was on the bus sitting next to Tommy Agency. And he went 0 for 10 in that in that game. He said, "Boy, that was the longest, toughest game I've ever played in my whole life." He said he had been out all night the night before. <laughs> Up the middle, and Reyes is there to stop it, and throws out Diaz one away. Well, 0 for 10 is bad enough, but 0 for 10 on April 15th that'll, that'll kill your batting average. It'd pretty be running right down the ground. I think um, Ag and Swoboda both went 0 for 10 in that game. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that's an awful big over. It's about that 24 inning game, I think it only took about four and a half or five. Wow, hours. almost one nothing. Yeah, the games move faster in those days. You know, the uh, 25 inning game, I had Bake McBride on my Connors corner at 3:30 at night, I will or never... in the morning, whatever, whichever way you look at it. And he came on the show. I said, "There's no way I could get a Cardinal to come on that show." And by gosh, he showed up. What were you paying in those days? $50. Well, there you go. <laughs> Needed what, the money. What it's still bad. That's for that before all these bonus fights. <laughs> Cabrera rips one down the left field line. That's a fair ball going to the corner. Jason Bay has to wait for the carom, and so Cabrera easily into second base with a one out double. The fourth hit of the game off Jonathan Meese. See, your strategy wouldn't have worked. That's right. That's <laughs> right. You kind of walk everybody and uh, yeah, yes to him. Pat, uh, walk Diaz with the bases loaded, but uh, a little more pressure in that situation for Cabrera. It makes a difference. Yep, more free swinging. You know, that 25 inning game, Ralph, I, I sat at home and watched that entire game. And I, what I remember is that you were down in your in your Kiner's Corner That's studio right. for about the eighth inning, and they kept showing you like every other inning, sitting there and waiting and waiting. <laughs> Well, and the guy that uh, was the losing pitcher in the game was a guy named Webb, not Hank Bill Webb. Webb. Hank Webb. Or, uh, Hank Webb, yeah. Bill Webb was doing the, I, mean, I think it was on the, he was the producer there, or the director there. Jason he Hayward takes He tried to pick the runner off first base, and McBride took off. Ball went down the right field line. You see how Hayward has risen to the moment when given the opportunity. He's 8 for 13 with runners in scoring position. At least he was coming into the day, and this is his first chance this afternoon. This discussion right here by Cora is to tell Nice to hold Cabrera close. He was getting an awfully big lead, and Jose's trying to keep him close with a left-handed hitter up. Hayward, just have Nice... Uh, Take a couple looks. Don't just give the same look over and over and over. Reyes providing a bit of a shadow for Cabrera. And Hayward takes below the knees. Two and one. Hayward is single to center off the glove of a diving Cora and then took a call third strike in the fourth. David Ross, the number eight hitter on deck. 20 year old Jason Hayward. And he falls behind him three and one. He hasn't hit left hand pitching well at all. He came into this game hitting 158 against left hand pitching. 
But he's gotten some big hits at the right time. Sure has. See Nice up to 110 pitches. And he walks Hayward. So now they're at two men on. And we'll see if that's the end of the line for Nice. With a right hand hitter coming up. Fernando Nieves up in the bullpen. But it's not Jerry coming out. It's Dan Warthin. So it looks like Nice will get one more batter. Well, he's gotten Ross a couple times now. And his last time up, Ross hit, uh, uh, hit a ground ball, which Nice needs right now. Five walks now for Jonathan Nice. Six strikeouts. He's allowed no runs and four hits. There's Nieve. Alongside Raul Valdez. Actually, that's Manny Acosta, not Fernando Nieve. 36, not 38. Acosta, the former Brave, I'm sure, a little pumped up today yeah. for an opportunity to face his old team. But Nice is going to hang in here. He's through 112 pitches against the Cubs in his five and two thirds innings on Monday. He's about to throw his 112th pitch in this game. Ross is in a blooper and a ground ball 0 for 2. And he takes below the knees, ball one. You got the pitcher Jurgens out on deck. I doubt if he did him a hit. He will, if he gets up, he, his turn comes up, he won't hit. I don't think. 2 and 0 now to Ross. He's pitching a good game. He has a shutout going. He might stay in the ball game, but ordinarily he would not hit. Unless he get him a couple of runs right here. How oh, would that be different? Yeah, it changes the whole thing around. That's the one great thing about the fact you don't have a DH. You have to make all these moves and know what your what your chances are if you do make. Yes. Well, there's nobody up in the Atlanta bullpen at the moment, so. It would appear Bobby Cox is leaning toward leaving Jurgens in. Well, you must have good eyes. You can see all the way out there. <laughs> I can see that there's nobody. That's about it. Can't tell you who it is if they're up. Three and one down to Ross. Bullpens are much easier to look into this year. That's the nice thing about the way they changed the configuration out there. They've done a really nice job. They're beautiful out there. And those folks out right near that bullpen. Hit hard toward the hole, past the diving right base hit. Around third comes Cabrera. He will score the first run of the game. David Ross with an RBI single, and it's 1 nothing Atlanta. When well, we talked about how valuable Ross is, Ralph, he has a, got a big base hit there, and the right wasn't playing over by the line on that one. He just couldn't get through that ball, which was hit in the hole. Jonathan Nice did some splendid work here this afternoon, but his afternoon is over. And Manny Acosta is going to come into the game to face his old team to try and keep this a 1 0 game. This call to the bullpen is brought to you by Lexus and your local Lexus dealers.
airport. <laughs> and there are no do-overs in baseball. <laughs> For a second straight start, Jonathan Neese not getting a whole lot of run support and one run right now. The difference, first run of the game brought to you by Toyota. Toyota moving forward. You can't even really say it was a mistake. Uh, if they moved that ball a little over, he might have a double play ball, but just got it past David Wright and Cabrera and the Braves, the first run. And he Acosta in to pitch to Jurgens, who gets the bunt down. Blanco makes the play to first. Two to four on the sacrifice, moving the runners to second and third. And Manny Acosta facing his old team. Well, you see his numbers there, I guess, Jerry counting on the revenge factor that Acosta can face his former teammates. Acosta made his Mets debut against the Cubs earlier this week. Had a very good first inning of work, striking out three, and then struggled in his second inning. Now Omar Infante with two in scoring position. Infante 0 for 3 today, reached on an error back in the first inning, struck out and grounded out. And a breaking ball strike. So Neath threw 116 pitches, which matches his career high. Five and a third innings, five hits, five walks, six strikeouts. One run so far and responsible for the two on base. And a slider for a strike to Infante, and it's 0 and 2. Two nice sliders there for Mr. Acosta. Get up in this count. This might be the biggest that bat of the game right here, Ralph. This is a big play right here, yeah. And the, of course, the five walks didn't help Nice at all. That, yeah. uh, those are the things that they got to go back and, and, and uh, notice. 0 2. Infante pops one up behind the plate. Blanco coming back. And not quite enough room. It was only about 45 feet between home plate and the barrier, the shortest distance in the major leagues, and that cost the Mets an out right there. And that's a big advantage for the Mets uh, hitters. They play most of their games, obviously, here, 81 games. And it helps the hitters a lot by having a short distance behind home plate. You sit in that front row behind home plate, it is amazing. It's like you're in the game. Yeah, it's almost like you're in the game. 0-2 to Infante. Struck him out with a slider. Here's a big out for Manny Acosta as he leads two in scoring position and keeps it a 1-0 game. Oh, Ralph Kiner, a tremendous season debut. Thanks for being All right. Good to be with you, Gary, once again. And also, Ron, thank you for everything. Make sure you to give Ann our best. All right. Thank you. Thanks for letting us share your food. All right. Yeah. <laughs>
Got to start them young. And of course, it is also Bark in the Park day here at City Field. And all the pooches are up in the Pepsi porch. Traveling this season, take the Mets with you. Subscribe to MLB.tv today to see every Mets game live or on demand on your computer. Visit Mets.com to order and get more details. MLB.tv, baseball everywhere. Third time around the batting order for the Mets against Jair Jurgens. As the Braves now have a 1 0 lead. Angel Pagan has been up twice and flied out both times. One for his last 15. See the corners in against Pagan, who's always a threat to lay one down. Jurgens misses low. 2 0. Will be Pagan, then Cora and Reyes as the Mets try and get even here in the sixth. This is a pitch as a leadoff hitter to Pagan now, leading off this sixth inning that you would almost automatically take. Would have been a tough pitch to hit. Yes, That's right. Two on the one. corner. <laughs> That's have had only two hits, a single by Bay in the second, a single by Blanco in the fifth. And that's been it. Popped up to shallow left. Diaz coming in. Escobar out and Diaz there to make the grab. You know, if you're at home and you're watching your kid and trying to teach him how to have a motion, just go right here. This is so simple. No real step. Great bounce. Tapping that right foot. That nice close with that front shoulder. Doing just about everything you're supposed to do to get yourself in position to deliver the ball. Very compact and nice. And for a guy about whom the Braves were a little concerned coming into the year because of the shoulder problems he had in the spring, as before it drops down a beauty of a bunt, Ross is going to have to field it and throws it out. Nice throw by David Ross to get Cora two away. But for a guy they were concerned about, there seemed to be no signs at all that he's struggling with that shoulder. No, especially in this game. He seems to be throwing all of his pitches pretty free and easy. Nice play by Ross. Bare hand, picks out the target, throws a strike. So quickly, two out and nobody on. And now Reyes, who's hit a comebacker and drawn a walk over one. Say in his second game, hitting third in the order after 591 straight games in the leadoff spot. Well, six out of the seven times he's come up in the third slot. No one on base. So much for the RBI chances. Gurgis has been able to keep his pitch count very low. Reyes takes high 3 and 0. So the question is, as a three hitter, you go up there looking to hack on 2 and 0, trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark. Well, if it was the old Reyes, I would say that a walk is as good as a hit because you can get in the scoring position with, uh, within a couple of pitches. But he's not stealing bases right now, but he's on base for the second straight time with a walk. The only two that Jurgens has given up this afternoon. So now the tying runs aboard for Jason Bay. We'll see whether Reyes is inclined now with two out to yeah. try and swipe a bag. He has not been very runnerish since coming back to the Mets two weeks ago. Bay single to left in the second, fly to right in the fourth, each time putting the first pitch in play. And this is what we were talking about earlier with Reyes and the potential of a steal. It's hard to steal if the hitter behind you is not giving you a chance to. And at the same time, you don't want Bay no, yeah. to be taking pitches for a stolen base. So that it's a bit of a contradiction. Well, I think we've seen from day one when Jurgens was at pitching at Shea Stadium, just the kind of competitor that he is as we see not only Ross go out, but also Roger McDowell to have a word with his young right hander. And knowing that this is a critical part of the game. You know, he's got two outs, but even though he's not hit a home run, one of the home run threats for the Met. Well, Jurgens also has thrown nine pitches in this inning, seven balls in the nine pitches. So, after walking Reyes on four pitches, throwing ball one to Bay. If you're going to break out, it's be a perfect time for it. 
They had an RBI triple in the game last night. And Jurgens again falls behind 2 0, third time in this inning. He's fallen behind 2 0. Reyes extends his lead, and Jurgens looks in on him. Side arming right hander. Peter Moylan gets up at the bullpen. There goes Reyes, the pitch outside. Ross's throw into the runner and goes into center field, and Reyes will go to third. So Jose Reyes with his third stolen base of the year takes third on the throwing error by David Ross. Well, shake of the head by Ross. That was not a good throw. A lot of times you'll rush the throw when you have the kind of jump that Reyes had. Ball sails up the line. Infante trying to make the catch the ball on the hop and make the tag at the same time. At the same time, comes up with nothing. Three and one out of bay. So the tying run 90 feet away with two out. Three and one to bay with right on deck. Into the air to center field. Back goes Cabrera, going back, looking up, and it's off the base of the wall. The Mets have tied the game. Bay pulls it to second base with a long RBI double, and the Mets have gotten even at one. So Reyes making like a leadoff hitter in that number three spot, a two-out walk, a steal, and Bay drives him in with a long two-base hit. When you see power hitters come out of their slumps, Gary, it usually results in extra base hits. A triple in last night's game to drive in Reyes and here a double over the head of Cabrera. Had no chance on that line drive. Fifth RBI of the year for Bay, his third two-base hit. Now the go-ahead run in scoring position with David Wright at the plate. And he pops the first pitch up in foul ground. Ross coming over, could have a play. And right in that on-deck circle, pulls it in to end the inning. But the Mets get their run right back after the Braves have taken the lead at the top of the inning as May drives in Reyes. 1-1 after six. Seventh thing in a 1 1 ball game. Yunel Escobar leads off against Manny Acosta. Escobar has walked twice and grounded out 0 for 1. He cost the Braves a run with his base running in the fifth inning when he failed to tag up on a fly ball by Troy Gloss and caused his teammate Prado to be tagged out in a rundown for a double play. And the breaking ball fouled off and it's 0 2. 
Well, the Mets got great relief work last night, particularly out of Isanori Takahashi. And going to the bullpen in the sixth inning today, the Mets bullpen has been terrific. 2.81 ERA, second in the league. But here's the caveat the Mets bullpen has thrown more bullpen innings than any team in the majors. Now, part of that has to do with having played a 20 inning game, but not completely. Sliders fouled off. The fact is that the Mets have been going to the bullpen early and often just about every day. Well, so today was a. Uh, a, a rule of thumb kind of game for the Mets. The starter went five and a third innings. At some point, you need somebody on your staff to go eight. Yeah. That's why I look at the, the Phillies with Halliday and just uh, what a luxury it is to have every fifth day. He'll go out with the threat of throwing the complete game. Now, at least the Mets have been getting a consistent seven out of Mike Pelfrey. Yes. We will go tomorrow night. Nice matchup, huh? Pelfrey against Hanson. 0 2 to Escobar, blown away. By the way, speaking of Takahashi, he uh, was presented today with the uh, lineup card from the dugout for his first big league win yesterday by uh, bullpen coach Randy Neiman. And what Takahashi did yesterday, his combination of accomplishments, swing and a miss, and Escobar down swinging, second strikeout for Acosta, one away, was something that only happens rarely. Here's what he did yesterday if you look at that third strike to Escobar. Takahashi struck out seven in relief, recorded his first major league hit, and got his first major league win. The last player to do all three of those things in the same game. John the Count Montefusco oh. in 1974 wow. for the Giants. Jeez. Seven strikeouts in relief. First hit, first win. Here's Martin Prado up for the second time. Takes up and in for ball one. And the first hit off Kawakami, right? Right. The first time that a Japanese born player has ever recorded his first hit against another Japanese born player. Quite a day. Wow. Greg Loss on deck. Prado doubled his first time up, took over for Chipper Jones, who left with a sore right hip on his 38th birthday. That eye black is streaking. Fastball strike two and one. Well, Costa throwing a little harder than he was the other night, and a little sharper breaking ball. I think he's a little pumped up. To face the Brave. Always. So, in that first time you go against your old club, you cannot wait to try to prove to them that they were wrong about you. Spent seven years in the Braves organization, parts of three years in the big leagues with Atlanta. Was in a total of 103 games for the Braves over the past three seasons. Three one to Prado and it's outside ball four. And so the Braves have a one out base runner. Sixth walk given up by Met pitching today and as we mentioned earlier the Mets lead the league in both walks and strikeouts from their pitching staff. Six walks and eight strikeouts today. One out and one on here's Gloss who hit the fly ball that resulted in the double play. When Gloss, I'm sure, thought he at least had a sacrifice fly in the fifth inning. Gloss also got credit for a double when Pagan lost the ball in the sun in the third. Blanco's going to run that ball back to Acosta after ball one to Gloss. Well, in his first appearance for the Mets, Acosta was outstanding through his first inning. And then he came back out for that second inning and struggled and gave up three runs. Hopefully, Jerry Manuel and the Mets hope it, that does not happen today. Dodgers will be coming to town here on Monday. Right now, LA is playing in Washington. Of course, they're without Manny Ramirez. So, Casey Blake has picked up the right hand batting slack. Blake's hit two home runs today. Wow. And the Dodgers are up 3 2 in the seventh in D.C. Blanco moves away, and it's 2 0 to Gloss. With another right hand batter, Matt Diaz, due up next. 
A lot of left hand hitting in the dugout for Bobby Cox today. He's got Nate McLeod. He's got Brian McCann. He's got Eric Hinsky. So plenty of moves that he can make late in this game against Met right handers. Twenty eight year old Manny Acosta a native of Panama started out in the Yankee organization. I guess they have a pretty pipeline. There. That's right. Mariano Rivera, the most famous player ever to come out of Panama, and his cousin Romero Mendoza also That's pitched right. for the Yankees. Very underrated pitcher on those teams, Mendoza. He was their long man, occasional start here and there. And Blanco is going to pay another visit to Mr. Acosta. This time a little slower. Well, the reason he's going out there now is Valdez was up, but now they're getting another right hander up, Henry Mejia. So Blanco going out to stall. That's why he's going out there now. He used to be in Oakland. Carney Lancer was the third base coach. And when Tony LaRusso wanted to take you out but needed some extra time, he would go to Carney Lansford and say, Carney, go out there and talk to the pitcher. And I always used to hate Carney coming in because I'd say, you know what? Get away from me, Carney. I know you're the kiss of death. As soon as you come over here, that means LaRusse is coming out. Now, here it's the middle of an at-bat. It's 3-0 to the hitter. And as a pitcher, you know that they're stalling to try and get you out of the game. Yeah. But you still have to continue and finish this at-bat. They're not going to bring in a new pitcher at 3-0. No, absolutely not. So you're, you're thinking to yourself, okay, I know this is, might be my last batter, but, you know, it's one out. You throw a strike, you maybe get yourself a ground ball. You got to watch Gloss here. He will swing yeah. 3 0. He has two home runs this year, including a game tying shot the other day. Taking all the way here, and it's 3 1. Actually, his was not the game time home run. That was Hayward's. Yes. And then McLeod hit the walk off. Now back. And now Costa's gotten himself back into it at three and two. It'd be tough to start Prado here because Gloss strikes out. But then again, on a ground ball, Gloss is an automatic double play. Well, both teams you know, struggling to score. Sometimes you just have to do something that's unconventional, be a little aggressive. Three and two with one out. Prado runs. Gloss strikes out. Blanco's throw is on the money. Strike him out. Throw him out. Double play. Blanco now four for four throwing out base runners this year. And Acosta gets himself out of the inning. Still one to one.
beverage. Yes, right? it'll be better. It'll be better. It'll be out cold. I was, uh, I was my dog. Sometimes that might be a good thing. <laughs> I saw some of the dogs uh, when I was coming in today. Most popular name too: Seaver and Shea. Really? Are the name of all the dogs. Yeah. Zipper have a dog here. <laughs> That's right. Ike Davis leads off the home seventh against Jair Jurgens and takes the changeup up and away. Tough day at the plate so far for Ike. A comeback or a strikeout. One for five in this series. The one a tape measure home run is first in the big leagues. Another off speed pitch high, and it's 2 0. Oh. It'll be Davis, then Frank Corey, and Blanco for the Mets in the bottom of the seventh. Jurgen still going strong at 85 pitches on the day. And Davis takes ball three. So after Jurgen's consistently fell behind hitters in the sixth inning and gave up the tying run, he's behind the leadoff hitter in the seventh. Very nice. Seat all his own. <laughs> and there's ball four, and Davis draws a leadoff walk. Third walk given up by Jurgens. Well, if you're just joining us, your video recap is brought to you by Mitsubishi. Jonathan Neese, six strikeouts in the first four innings today. The Braves got the first run of the game. On a base hit by David Ross. Gives it his double in the sixth inning, tied it up. And that's where we are, one to one as we play in the seventh, with the go-ahead run now at first and Frank Corr at the plate. And Jeff smacks one deep toward right center field, chasing back as Cabrera. He won't get there, and it hits the fence on the fly at the 4:15. Davis around third and heading home. Here's the throw to the plate by Escobar. Not in time for the quarter third. He's safe, and the Mets lead two to one. A 400. 15 foot double off the bat of Jeff Frank Corr, and the Mets grab the lead for the first time today. Oh, Frank Corr playing great against his former team. Nice hitting here. Fastball out over the middle of the plate, and great job of driving this over the head of Cabrera. Bounces off the fence and comes back to Cabrera, though. Great read by Davis. He knew the entire time that Cabrera was not going to get to that ball, and that is the only reason that Chip Hale was able to send him in. And as soon as the throw comes in a little late, Ross, of course, throws it to third base. And front court, good read, getting there under the tag. Now the infield has to come in with Henry Blanco at the plate. And he hits one in the air to left. Frank Corr tagging. In comes Diaz to make the catch. Frank Corr's going to try it. Here comes the throw by Diaz. Offline, and Frank Corr scores. And it's 3-1. to one. The Braves appeal at third, but they say that Frank Corr did not leave early. Sacrifice fly for Henry Blanco. And the Mets have a 3-1 to one lead. Aggressive base running by Frank Corr with nobody out. Who says base running is underrated? Able to go from second to third, put him in position, and then was very aggressive against Diaz, who was in shallow left field. Diaz does not throw the ball particularly great. Offline, Frank Corr with the third run for the Mets. So the Mets putting up two runs in a heartbeat against Jurgens, who beat them four times without a loss last year. And now the Mets have a 3-1 to one lead. Frank Catalanato now will pinch hit for Manny Acosta, who is pitcher of record on the long side. Frank pinch hit last night and grounded out to short. And Jurgens misses low, 1-1. One so a leadoff walk on four pitches to Ike Davis. Frank Corey in a different ballpark in the two games of this series would have three home runs. <laughs> he hit one off the top of the fence in left field last night that would have gone out of any other ballpark. Hit one to the fence that was caught last night that would have gone out of most ballparks. And the double he just hit to 415. That's out of almost every park. Catalanato barely misses an extra base hit. And it's one and two. Chalk before the bag, but not quite. Frank could use one of those right now. Two for 15 on the year. One out and nobody on. Two runs home here in the seventh. And he grounds one out to the second baseman. And Fonte makes the play for the second out. So two out and nobody on. And now Angel Pagan will bat. 
Pagan has evenly distributed three fly balls today. Center, right, and left. Well, like Davis, might not have got a hit today, but he seems to always be in the middle of the action, isn't he? It's just outstanding base running by a right, good read that Cabrera was not going to get to the front court double. And normally when a ball caroms that perfectly back to an outfielder, you're going to be holding up the runner. But I had a good enough head of yeah. steam that Chip Hale sent him all the way. And that not only enabled him to score, but enabled Frank Gore to get to third where he could score on the sack fly. So Davis's base running not only affected his run, it affected the run behind him. Absolutely. See that one finger there? That's Chip Hale saying to Angel Pagan, take one pitch. And ball four, so Pagan's on for the first time today. Second walk of the inning and the fourth of the game for Jurgens. He was a strike thrower early in this game, but it has been a scuffle for him the last couple of innings. And that's going to be all for Jurgens as Bobby Cox is on his way out to the mound to make a change. Well, the uh, Mets, who have seen Jurgens go 6 and 1 lifetime against them, will send him out of the game with the Mets leading. The call to the bullpen brought to you by Lexus and your local Lexus dealers. Lefty Eric O'Flaherty comes in to face Alex Cora and throws a first pitch strike. O'Flaherty was originally signed by his hometown team. Flaherty from Walla Walla, Washington, signed with the Seattle Mariners and claimed off waivers from the Braves. Outstanding last season, all career highs, 78 appearances. And off to a great start this year. Pagan at first with two down. Mets have two runs home here in the seventh. Cora today 0 for 3 tried to bunt his way on his last time up and Ross made a very nice play to throw him out. Let's see if Pagan tries to swipe one here against the lefty. Let's see used the stolen base to good effect in the sixth inning when Reyes swiped second with two out and scored the Mets first run of the game. Angel gets back. The 
Sagan with one steal so far this year. And Cora gets tied up inside. One and two. Well, you think they'd see an advantage here with O'Flaherty with this nice running fastball in on Cora. Cora, though, consistently throughout his entire career has always hit well against left-handed pitching. His first career at bat against O'Flaherty. Snap Ooh. throw and Pagan diving back. There's a throw you don't see too much anymore from the left-handers. That step off and flick it over there. It's a great move. Sometimes catch someone sleeping. There has been far less slumber for Mr. Pagan so far this year. The thing about Angel, he knew exactly what he needed to do to be a better player. He needed to go to school and work on his base run. Yeah. And he's worked hard on it. Well, I know that Jeff Francoeur said uh, last night, he said, you know what, Angel, you might have had some kind of tough plays. You've made in the past here, but that play last night was about as smart as any base runner could make. It's a bad dash for home with the Braves confused on the infield fly rule. To watch him running in with that great speed and Chip Hale bouncing up and down, telling him to go, was about as good a shot as we get. Cora inside outs one down to third, and Prado throws him out to end the inning. But the Mets fashion a pair of runs in the seventh inning. Jeff Francoeur right in the middle of it. Hit one off the 4-15 mark for a double. Using his base running and coming on in on the Blanco sacrifice line. It's 3-1 New York. Dot com today. The Padres are rolling, going for their eighth in a row. Wade LeBlanc, six innings, no runs, three hits today. Adrian Gonzalez, another home run, and they lead the Reds in the ninth. Two home runs for Casey Blake as the Dodgers lead the Nats in the eighth. Everything else later on. Including the Giants, who got another stellar performance out of their Cy Young ace, Lincecum. Last night and beating the Cardinals. Let's go now 4 0. Here's Fernando Nieve to pitch for the Mets in the eighth inning. Well, Nieve, of course, leading the team and in innings pitched out of that bullpen and appearances. 12 appearances. This is the 18th game. You know, those early season on a pace for it. Yes. He's on a pace for 108 games. Oh, that'd be a record. Yes, it would. Mike Marshall, I believe, has the record at 106. I don't think anybody else has ever gotten to 100. 
And Fernando doesn't even have a degree in kinesiology. I mean, right. do it all on his own. Well, Mike Marshall was a Cy Young winner in 1974 when he appeared in 106 games. Driven to right field by Diaz, and he gets the Braves started with a leadoff hit in the eighth. The Diaz, who normally doesn't swing the bat well against right-handers, does here and has an opposite field hit. Well, wanted that pitch away and down and was up and in. So, completely missed there by Fernando. So, now the tying run comes to bat with Melky Cabrera, who has scored the only run for the Braves today after doubling in the sixth. Turns around about left handed against Nieve. Why a job in relief by Manny Acosta, the former Brave pitching against his old team, an inning in two thirds, no runs, no hits, a walk, and three strikeouts. You know, when your starting pitcher leaves the game prematurely, Maine last night with a, an injury and only into the sixth inning by Nice today, four and two thirds by Takahashi and Acosta, 10 punch outs. Mm. Pretty impressive. Well, the Mets bullpen continues to shine. Jason Hayward on deck. Now trying to get six outs and make Acosta a winner. Two and one now to Cabrera. Nice went five and a third, a lot of run on five hits, five walks, six strikeouts, and no decision game for him. And so Jonathan will remain without a win through his first four starts, but continues to pitch well. If short. Two and two now to Cabrera. By the way, John Maine said before the game today that he thinks he can make his next start on Wednesday after coming up with left elbow issues yesterday. He said it was very similar, if not the same, as the problem that befell him a couple of years ago in his non pitching arm. But it remains to be seen whether he'll actually be able to pitch on Wednesday. Now back two and two to Cabrera. John, who was so frustrated at having to come out yesterday, it looked like he was getting his act together. Another foul ball off the bat of Cabrera. Been lots of stops and starts for Mr. Main the last few seasons. Sitting next to the assistant trainer. That's not a good thing. <laughs> Cabrera pops one up, could be playable for right. And David retreats to make the grab. One away. Well, nice job by John. I'm sorry, nice job by David there with that backpedaling, making that catch. So Nieve faces two batters, and now with the left hand swinging, Jason Hayward coming up. That's a go to the left hander here in the eighth. Call to the bullpen brought to you by AT&T. Find out what's possible with the nation's fastest 3G network. Perpetual Pedro coming on.
Mazda. Zoom, zoom. Would love to be taking a little run around the reservoir today. Well, we're going to get a victory here, then we'll go, Gary. Gorgeous. Beautiful day. Pedro Feliciano comes on to face Jason Hayward with a man on. Well, Feliciano in his 10th game has been so valuable for this Met team the last three seasons, four seasons really. Now 33 years old, he just keeps getting better. Jason Hayward get, takes a strike. Hayward grounded out against Feliciano last night. We're we talking about uh, appearances and the record. Mike Marshall 106. The next highest total after Marshall is 94. So no one's even come close. Get to Colby once had 94 appearances and Solomon Torres in 2006 had 94 games for the Pirates. Pirates, right. 0 and 2 to Hayward with David Ross on deck. Dies at first and one out. And Hayward grounds one to third. Might be two. Right to Cora. Quick throw to first. Not in time. Cora get upended by Matt Diaz and tried to get that toss away, but Hayward with too much speed down the line. That keeps the inning alive for the Braves. See David, the throw to Cora. And Cora knew he had to rush that because of the speed of Hayward and just tried to get rid of it as quick as he could. And luckily get that right knee out of the way of Diaz. And Cora was banged up earlier in the game, diving for a base hit by uh, Hayward up the middle. Looks like he might have bruised his side. Managed to avoid a collision there. Now David Ross will step in against Feliciano. Brian McCann has come out on deck to pinch hit. Ross has the only RBI for the Braves today. Hayward has not attempted a stolen base yet. And Ross takes outside for ball one. Well, we know Hayward can run. In fact, we just saw it. <laughs> he can run. But there's a difference between being able to run and being a base stealer. Yeah, especially off the left-hander. That'll be, you know, his learning curve is going to still be a little short in that department. And you'd be probably reluctant even with an accomplished base stealer to run here down by two runs in the eighth. Two runs, and Ross is a home run threat, legit home run threat. Now Feliciano behind 2-0, and and he leaves it low and away, ball three. Now if he walks Ross, you're bringing up a really good hitter in McCann, even though it would be lefty against lefty. But Feliciano keeping that ball away from Ross. Now on 3-0, there's ball four, and now the tying runs are on base with McCann coming up to pinch hit. So McCann getting the day off today, day game after a night game with the Mets starting a lefty. Went 0 for 3 last night. See 261 average, but the very high on base percentage because McCann, who normally bats cleanup, has not been getting a whole lot of pitches to hit. Well, look at this outfield defense. Very interesting. Jeff Francoeur was pushing Pagan over into left center against McCann, against the left-hander Feliciano, as Francoeur is taking charge on the outfield defense. Well, nobody knows McCann better than Francoeur, who he's uh, been friends with since Little League. He knows that McCann likes to shoot the gap in left center, especially against the left-handers. Tying runs on base with two down, three to one New York, eighth inning. And McCann asks for time. There is one right handed bat in Bobby Cox's dugout, the switch hitter Brooks Conrad, but he would much prefer to have McCann up in this spot against Feliciano. And McCann lines one towards short, picked off by Reyes, right on the webbing of the glove. Side retired. Reyes, full extension to grab it. And it's stuck at the end of the bench. Retires McCann to put an end to the inning.
center field here at City Field. Your live score brought to you by Freescore.com. Life costs more without Freescore. That's doing what they've done virtually every game on this homestand. Not scored early, gotten good pitching, scored in the middle of the game, and their bullpen making it stand up. Well, they'd love to get some add on runs. It's going to be difficult against Chris Medlin. 33 games of relief last year, four starts for the smallish right hander, but he's got outstanding stuff. Small ish. Small ish. Well, I mean, for, you know, pitchers, they, they make them 6 3 and. Well, especially for right-handers, as Reyes takes a strike. I mean, you've seen a lot of little lefties over the years. Not too many five-foot, ten-inch right-handers pitch in the major leagues. That's right. But he's got all four pitches. Back for a breaking ball misses. Reyes has walked twice, stolen a base, scored a run. It's almost like he's a leadoff hit. <laughs> Change up by Medlin is one and two. It'll be Reyes, then Bay and Wright as the Mets look to tack on here in the eighth. The Mets have had only four hits today, but RBI doubles by Bay and Frank Cora have highlighted the attack. And the Mets getting outstanding relief pitching from Manny Acosta, Fernando Nieve, and Pedro Feliciano behind Jonathan Nice. Two and two to Reyes. And he has to move his feet to get out of the way. Well, I think only Reyes and maybe Mookie Wilson can get out of the way of that pitch. Yeah, but Ross caught it. <laughs> Edmund didn't. <laughs> Still three and two to Jose. Francisco Rodriguez did not have a save before two nights ago. Got a five out save on Thursday. A um, skittish save last night. And now he'll be trying for three in a row. He has fouls it straight down. When he saved those 62 games, he had 69 opportunities that season for the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. So they can come in bunches. And they usually do. He's going to try to continue this trend. Last two days, Mets relief pitching, eight innings, one run ball. And Reyes goes down swinging at the changeup. So Medlin strikes out the first man to face him. If you're looking for some good news, check out the Picks News at 10. Every weeknight, Jim Watkins and Kaidi Tong get you caught up on the economy, world events, and local stories that affect your life. Plus, Mr. G's got your reliable five day forecast. Don't miss the news at 10 weeknights here on Picks. Here's Jason Bay, who's had a good day at the plate, a single and a double, and he's driven in a run. Hit the double to the center field fence in the sixth inning, and he pops this one up, shallow center. Out goes Infante, in comes Cabrera, and it drops! Jeez. And Bay is safe. Well, that's the second one today that has fallen in. Blanco had a base hit to a similar spot in the fifth inning, and now Bay has his third hit of the day. This has not been a well-played series by the Braves. Bobby might close those doors after the game today. Infante trying to look through that sun. That is the center fielder's ball. Cabrera's got to come in more aggressive and make that play. Too difficult for Infante in this sun field. Well, the Braves made four errors last night. They've been charged with only one error today, but a couple of balls that absolutely should have been caught. So the Mets will try and take advantage with David Wright at the plate. David's 0 for 3 today. And the curveball sits high for ball one. Jason Bay appears to be pointed in the right direction now. That obviously was a lucky hit. That's all right, though. When the, when the worm turns, you get those breaks. Mm -hmm. And he's hit the ball hard a couple of times today. So it's starting to mesh for Jason. The strikeouts have disappeared the last couple of days. David has to move back. That's the key for Jason. Uh, haven't seen him that long, but if he starts making contact, you're in a good place. And 
Medlin wisely, wisely checking in because Bay will sneak a stolen base. Stole 13 last year, one so far this year. Yeah, there's a strike to right two and one. You mean like Henry Blanco? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he sneaks them every nine years, <laughs> like clockwork. Remember, uh, Mets had Rick Cerrone, the catcher, late in his career. Spongy. We were in Montreal and he stole a base. And uh, after the game, his teammates presented him with the base. I wonder if Blanco will get similar treatment today. <laughs> that would be funny. Do one to right. And he loops one foul. Spongy, when he was with the Mets, that's the year that John Gibbons got hurt in the last day of spring training. And I'll never forget that uh, we were getting on the plane to come up from spring, come to New York. Spongy turned to me and said, hey, I didn't sign here to play every day now. Come on. <laughs> I mean, they, they got to recognize my talents. Strictly a Sunday catch. That's right. 2-2. Two -two. Hit toward the hole, run down by Infante, out at second. Escobar's turn, 4 6 3 double play. Nicely done by the Braves to end the inning. So the Mets have turned aside in the bottom of the eighth. Now it's up to K Rod looking for three saves in three days as we go to the ninth at City Field. Legend of the Seeker. For more baseball, you can tune it over to SNY for a Lincoln Mercury post game live on SNY after every game, including today. The dogs have enjoyed the afternoon. Nice sunny day out of the Pepsi porch. Do your dogs just sit there no. and relax like that? There's just... no way that my dog would sit in one spot or even one section area. For nine area. Not Look, a chance. Well, well, this guy. Some dogs live in a, in a, in a carry on bag. K Rod comes on to try for his third save in three days. See the numbers on K Rod. Pitched himself out of a little jam in last night's ball game. Omar Infante leads off, bluffs a bunt, and takes high. Well, there was one very serious moment for K Rod last <laughs> night after a single and a walk. Nate McLeod hit one screaming down the right field line that pushed foul. Would have tied the game had it stayed fair, and then McLeod and Prado struck out to end it. Fonte chases a high fastball. It's one and one. It's the same thing that happened last night. The Braves got a runner on, and Fonte flew out the center field on the first pitch. Here, the Braves need a couple of runners, and he swings to that second pitch that probably would have been a ball out of the strike zone. Fonte 0 for 4 today after going 3 for 4 last night. And K Rod staying with the fastball high, 2 and 1. Jonathan Neese started, went 5 and a third, allowed a run on five hits, but 
Pitcher of the day was Manny Acosta, the former Brave, an inning and two thirds, no runs, no hits, and he's in line for the win. Fernando Nieve and Pedro Feliciano shared the scoreless eighth. And Infante pops one up. Reyes retreating. And makes the grab one away. So one out for K-Rod at the top of the night. And now you know Escobar, who has walked twice, grounded out and struck out 0 for 2. Dipping below the Mendoza line. Not where you're accustomed to seeing Escobar. He's also made a base running blunder that cost the Braves a run back in the fifth inning. Kara throwing more fastballs today. The Escobar's numbers against Frankie Rodriguez, three for four. Another fastball, but it's two and zero. Oh. Martin Prado is waiting on deck. Remember, Chipper Jones left this game after his second at bat because of a sore right hip. Otherwise, he would be on deck, which certainly changes the nature of this inning. Not that Prado's not a capable hitter, but it's Chipper Jones. And that's a problem this Atlanta team has. Over the last five or six years, you've got a guy who's the linchpin yeah. of your offense who has been unreliable in terms of his presence. Now, two seasons ago, hit that 364, led the National League in hitting. It's been a tough goal but for Chipper to stay on the field. Two and one to Escobar. And he takes a fastball for a strike. Two and two. Kieran throwing gas here in the ninth inning. Working the third straight day. Day game after a night game. Changing the program a little bit. Two two. Good rip at that fastball. Does that really make your helmet fit tighter? <laughs> you know, you bring up a good point, though, Gary. When you face a team a couple days in a row or three days in a row as a stopper, sometimes you do have to change it up a bit. It's been all fastballs here to Escobar. And the changeup popped up. Reyes retreats. Bay comes in, and Reyes stays with it. With Bay scuffing on by, two out. Well, there's been a difference on those two plays. We've seen a lot of plays. Those pop-ups drop in the outfield. You could tell by Reyes's body language that no one was going to catch this one except him. Aggressively going after the baseball. Even though Bay was calling yeah. him off, and technically Reyes should have given way. Good thing there was no yeah. collision. So the Braves are down to their final out of the afternoon. Martin Prado up for the third time. He's doubled and walked in his two trips. And he takes a fastball for a strike. Gaudy batting average being carried around by Mr. Prado right now at 415. Trying to keep it going and get glossed to the plate as the tying run. A one from K-Rod. To shortstop. Reyes gets in front of it. And the ball game is over. Francisco Rodriguez comes in to get his third save in three days. The Mets are now 5-1 and one on the homestand. Manny Acosta gets his first win as a Met as he beats his old team. And the Mets get just enough offense on run-scoring doubles by Bay and Frank Corr to win 3-1. to one. Well, Jonathan Neese got into the sixth inning. Some good bullpen pitching by the Mets and on the offensive side. Three hits for Jason Bay. An outstanding inning with the walk to Ike Davis. Jeff Francoeur with the double took third. The sacrifice fly by Henry Blanco stole the base this afternoon. 
All around good effort here for the Mets on this outstanding homestand just when they needed it. And the Mets able to hang a loss on Jair Jurgens, who beat them four straight times last year. The game summary brought to you by your Tri-State Area Volkswagen dealers. Visit TriStateVW.com. Three hits for Jason Bay today, including the RBI double that got the offense going. The Mets had only five hits, but that was enough as the Mets get to the 500 mark for the season. Now five and one on this homestand, including the last three in a row. K-Rod's been in on all three. Mets win 3-1. We'll be right back to City Field.